I heard about that. They, they were saying I was, like, threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest oh, gangster. No, it's right. true. We no, but think question. of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. When he's speaking about the American people, that's not what you just showed. Well, he was asked no, about that No, specific... no, that's not what you just showed in all no, fairness no, no. and I'm respect you to that you. That was the question that we asked him. Uh, he didn't show that. And you and I both know that he has talked about turning the American military on the American people. He has talked about going after people who are engaged in peaceful protest. He has talked about locking people up because they disagree with him. This is a democracy to be able to allow Israel to have the resource. Did you notice Brett Baer look off to the side? Let's go back just a second because someone has clearly signaled to Brett Baer that this can't continue. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch his face. Contrast that is presented for folks to make a decision and there are critics that they feel who look at what the administration did and say and think differently. Madam Vice President, they're wrapping me very hard here. All I can say, folks, is this interview that Vice President Kamala Harris has taken on with Fox News, Brett Baer, has completely destroyed Kamala Harris and Tim Walt's campaign. Watch this. Good to be with you, Brett. You know, voters tell pollsters all over the country and here in Pennsylvania that immigration is one of the key issues that they're looking at this election, and specifically the influx of illegal immigrants from more than 150 countries. How many illegal immigrants would you estimate your administration has released into the country over the last three and a half years? Wow. He started it off with a quick jab to the stomach. Well, I'm glad you raised the issue of immigration because I agree with you. It is a, it is a, a topic of discussion that people want to rightly have. And you know what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, right but do you, now, just a number. Is, do you but, think it's but, one million, three million? Brett, let's just get to the point. Okay, the point is that we have a broken immigration system that needs to be repaired. So your and Homeland Security Secretary said that 85% well, no, of apprehensions... I'm not finished. I'm not finished. We have, a, we have so an immigration system... It's a rough estimate of 6 million people have been released be, but, into the country. And let me just finish. I'll get to the question, I promise you. I was beginning to answer. And <laughs> when, when you came into office, your administration immediately reversed a number of Trump border policies. Most significantly, the policy that required illegal immigrants to be detained through deportation, either in the U.S. or in Mexico... And you switched that policy. They were released from custody awaiting trial. So instead, included in those were a large number of single men, adult men, who went on to commit heinous crimes. So looking back, do you regret the decision to terminate Remain in Mexico at the beginning of your administration? So we are only like two minutes, not even two minutes into the interview, started off with an initial jab. Two, we saw them... There was a brief spat argument shouting already like 30 seconds into the interview. And now for the third, for the second jab uh, by Brett Baer to Kamala Harris. Watch this. At the beginning of our administration, within practically hours of taking the oath, the first bill that we offered Congress before we worked on infrastructure, before the Inflation Reduction Act, before the Chips and Science Act, before any, before the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first bill, practically within hours of taking the oath, was a bill to fix our immigration system. Yes, ma'am. It was called and, the U.S. Citizen and, Citizenship Act of 2021. Exactly. It and, was essentially so, but, but a I, pathway I, to citizenship for the finish, Yes, ma'am. May I finish, may I finish responding, <laughs> please? But, here, but, this, but you have to let me finish. You please. had the White House and the House and the Senate, I'm and in they the didn't bring up that bill. I'm responding to the point you're raising. Okay. I think it's so funny because the exact same thing happens with Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, but Kamala Harris looks like she's not able to handle a little bit of pressure during an interview. And I'd like to finish. Yes, ma'am. We recognized from day one that to the point of this being your first question, it is a priority for us as a nation and for the American people. And our focus has been on fixing a problem. And from day one, then, we have done a number of things, including to address our asylum system and put more resources, getting more judges, what we needed to do to tighten up penalties and increase penalties for illegal crossings. 
what we needed to do to deal with ports, points of entry between border entry points. That's the work we did, and we worked on supporting what was a bipartisan effort, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress, to actually strengthen the border. That border bill would have put 1,500 more border agents at the border, which is why I believe the Border Patrol agents supported the bill. It would have allowed us to stem the flow of fentanyl coming into the United States, which is a scourge affecting people of every background, every geographic location in our country, killing people. It would have allowed us to put more resources into prosecuting transnational criminal organizations, which I have done yes, as the attorney general, former attorney general of a border state. Madam Vice President, a couple prosecuted of Prosecuted trafficking of drugs, six, guns, and human beings. And six Donald Democrats, Trump, but let me just finish. Six and Democrats Donald voted Trump against that bill. learned about that bill and told them to kill it because he preferred to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. And in this election, this is rightly a discussion that the American people want to have. And what they want are solutions, and they want a president of the United States who's not playing political games with the issue, I hear you. but actually is focused on fixing Six it. Democrats voted against that bill. It would have allowed 1.8 million illegal immigrants into the country a year. A lot, a lot of conservatives had a problem with it. Kamala Harris is hell-bent on getting her talking points in. She has to get her initiatives in. These are the six Democrats. But more importantly, back to the original premise, Jocelyn Nungary, Rachel Morin, Lakin Riley, they are young women who were brutally assaulted and killed by some of the men who were released at the beginning of the administration, well Horrible. before a negotiated uh, bipartisan bill. Former President Clinton actually referred to Lakin Riley Sunday campaigning for you in Georgia, saying if those men had been properly vetted, Lakin Riley probably would not have been killed. So if it wouldn't have happened, this is well before any negotiation. This is well before Donald Trump got involved in the politics. This is a specific policy decision by your administration to release these men into the country. So what I'm saying to you, no, do you no, no, owe Brett, those families I think really, I think an apology? Me... Wow, put her on the spot. Does Kamala Harris owe the families of these victims an apology? Let's see how she responds to this one. I just say, first of all, those are tragic cases. There's no question about that. There is no question about that. And I can't imagine the pain that the families of those victims have experienced for a loss that should not have occurred. So that is true. It is also true that if a board of security had actually been passed nine months ago, it would be nine months that we would have had more border agents at the border, more support for the folks who are working around the clock trying to hold it all together Madam Vice President. to ensure that no future harm would occur. And this election in 20 days will determine whether we have a president of the United States who actually cares more about fixing a problem, even if it is not to their political advantage in an election, because there was a solution, Brett. Now, I got to ask you guys, do you think who is the better who's better for the country, Kamala Harris or Donald J. Trump for fixing our border situation that Kamala Harris has clearly admitted is a massive problem that apparently the Biden Harris administration has had a lot to do with? Vice President, it was a policy decision in the early part of your administration. I will let one of the mothers talk about it. Take a listen. Ooh, no. Because of the Biden-Harris administration open border policies catch and release, they were enrolled in the Alternatives to Detention program. This meant that they were released into the United States. It was not even a full three weeks later that they would take my daughter Jocelyn Nungare's life. I believe the Biden-Harris administration open border policies are responsible for the death of my daughter. That's the early days. So do you owe them an apology? That's so horrible. I should tell you that I am so sorry for her loss. I am so sorry for her loss. Does that make up for her loss, though? Kamala Harris's apologies, does that really make up for the loss that this mother has endured, the family that she'll never ever see grow up? grandchildren that she'll never meet i mean this is this is a this is a uh she's ruined this entire family's family tree here 
sincerely. But let's talk about what is happening right now with an individual who does not want to participate in solutions. Let's talk about that as well. But do you right? want an in, answer in all her? fairness, I told you I feel awful for what she and her family have experienced. During that time, you said repeatedly that the border was secure. When in your mind did it start becoming a crisis? I think it, we've had a broken immigration system transcending, by the way, Donald Trump's administration even before. Let's, let's all be honest about that. I have no pride in saying that this is a perfect immigration system. I've been clear, I think we all are, that it needs to be fixed. We need more, I was just down at the border talking with border agents and they will tell you, and I'm sure you probably, I know you investigate and you are a, a serious journalist. They will tell you, we need more judges. We need, to process, we need to process those cases faster. We need the support for those cases that should be prosecuted. They need more resources, and Congress ultimately is the only place that that's going to get fixed, Brett. Well, that's how the system that's, works. That's the premise that's, of this question. But there that's were 90 the plus works. executive orders that were rescinded in the first days. Many of those were Trump border policies. I'm not going to stay here because. There's other things to talk about, but you frequently were talk to the Border Patrol Union for support of that bipartisan bill, and they did. They supported it. But they also just endorsed Donald Trump and said, you've been, quote, a failure with border security. Ooh. Why do you think they said that? This is brutal. Watch Kamala Harris squirm. I think they're frustrated, and I get it. They want support. They want support, and that's what that border security bill would have done. These guys down at the border, these men and women, they're working hard. They're working around the clock. I get it. There's a lot of people that look back at what you said in 2019 when you first ran for president. Uh, and there have been changes, and you've talked about some of them. When it comes to immigration, you supported allowing immigrants in the country illegally to apply for driver's license, to qualify for free tuition at universities, to be enrolled in free health care. Do you su still support those things? Listen, that was five years ago, and I'm very clear that I will follow the law. I have made that statement over and over again, and as Vice President of the United States, that's exactly what I've done, not to mention before. You, if that's the case, you chose a running mate, Tim Walz, who, governor of Minnesota, who signed those very things into state law. So do you support that? Wow. So what Brett Baer has done is he has single-handedly uh, cornered Kamala Harris using her own uh, policy that she supports, pinning her against Tim Waltz, who has a history of doing the exact opposite. Watch this. We are very clear, and I am very clear, as is Tim Waltz that we must support and enforce federal law, and that is exactly what we will do. So decriminalizing border crossings, like you said in 2019. I, I do not believe in decriminalizing border crossings, and I've not done that as vice president, and I will not do that as president. So, so suddenly she doesn't believe in decriminalizing border policies because we have video footage. You guys can check our channel, uh, previous videos, where we show Kamala Harris multiple times saying that she doesn't believe that border crossing should be criminalized. So these are evolutions I, and, and, that but, you've had. No, but let's be very clear. I'm the only person who's running for president who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations from the Sinaloa cartel to the Guadalajara quota, cartel to people who have trafficked in guns, drugs, and human beings. I have spent a significant part of my career going after people who present a threat to the safety of the American people and, and cross our border with the intent of doing us harm and cross our border illegally. And I will do that work as vice president. I take that work quite seriously. This is a time when voters, especially here in Pennsylvania, are inundated with commercials and ads. They just want it to stop because it's every commercial. But many of them add noise, but a few of them seem to break through. This particular one from the Trump campaign has gotten a lot of attention. Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners. Surgery. Um, for prisoners. For prisoners. Every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access. Wow. Horrible. Unbelievable. So are you still in support of using taxpayer dollars to help prison inmates or detained illegal aliens to transition to another gender? 
just to add a little bit of clarity, guys, Kamala Harris, you've already heard it, wants to use your money to pay for criminals and uh, illegal immigrants who are in the prisons to get sex change operations. Does this make any sense? Do you want to know that they're taking money from you to spend it on that? Let me know, guys. I will follow the law. And it's a law that Donald Trump actually followed. Um, you're probably familiar with now it's a public report that under Donald Trump's administration, these uh, surgeries were available to on a medical necess necessity basis to. Since when is there a medical necessity to have your gender changed? What? Who here is trying to have their balls removed because it was an emergency? <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. People in the federal prison system. And I think, frankly, that ad from the Trump campaign is a little bit of like throwing you know, stones when you're living in a glass house. The Trump aides say that he never advocated for that prison policy and no gender transition well, surgeries happened Well, you know what, you got to take responsible his, for what happened presidency. in your administration. Yeah, no surgeries happened in his pregnancy. It's, it's in so black and white. Would you still advocate for using taxpayer dollars for gender reassignment surgeries? I will surgeries? follow the law, just as I, I, well, you I think Donald so Trump would say he did. You would have a say as president. I, like I said, I think it's real. he spent $20 million on those ads trying to create a sense of fear in the voters because he actually has no plan in this election that is about focusing on the needs of the American people. Whereas, at $20 million on that ad, on an issue that, as it relates to the biggest issues that affect the American people, is really quite remote. And again, his policy was no different. Look at where we are, though. They on plans for the American people, on. I'm offering a plan to deal with affordable housing. I'm offering a plan to deal with what we need to do to strengthen small businesses, which are the backbone of America's economy. I am offering a plan that is about taking care of young parents and giving them the support they need. My plans for the economy will strengthen the economy, as have been reviewed by 16 Nobel laureates, uh, Goldman Sachs, Moody's, and recently the Wall Street Journal, which have all studied our plans and have indicated my plans for our economy would strengthen our economy. His would make them weaker, Why do you would think ignite more inflation, say, and invite a recession by the middle of next year. Those you, are the facts. Why do you think more people say they trust him on the economy than they trust you? Ooh. I think that when you look at an analysis of our plans for what we would do as president of the United States, it has been clear to those who study and understand how economic policy works that moving forward, because I do believe the American people are ready to turn the page on the divisiveness and the, the type of rhetoric that has come out of Donald Trump. People are ready to chart a new way forward and they want a president who has a plan for the future and a plan that is sound and will strengthen our country. My plan for the economy does exactly that. His plan would be again to give tax cuts to billionaires and the biggest corporations in our country and blow up our deficit. It's interesting you said turn the page, Madam Vice President. You were asked on two different shows last week what, if anything, you would do differently than President Biden. Here's yeah. what you said. And she said she wouldn't do a damn thing different. Would you have done something differently than President Biden during the past four years? Uh, there is not a thing that comes to mind in terms of, and I've been a part of, of, of most of the decisions that have had impact. Under a Harris administration, what would the major changes be and what would stay the same? Sure. Well, I mean, I'm obviously not Joe Biden. Um, I know. And so <laughs> that would be one change yes. in terms of, yes. but also it, I think it's important to say with, you know, 28 days to go, I'm not Donald Trump. So, I noticed. you're not Joe Biden, you're not Donald Trump, but, but nothing comes to mind that you would do differently? Let me be very clear. My presidency will not be a continuation of Joe Biden's presidency. And like every new president that comes in to office, I will bring my life experiences, my professional experiences, and fresh and new ideas. I represent a new generation of leadership. I, for example... I'm someone who has not spent the majority of my career in Washington, D.C. I invite ideas, whether it be from the Republicans who are supporting me, who were just on stage with me minutes ago, and the business sector, 
and others who can contribute to the decisions that I make about, for example, my plan for increasing the supply of housing in America and bringing down the cost of housing. Addressing the issue of small businesses, which is about working with the private sector to bring more capital and access to capital to our small business leaders, including my plan mm -hmm. for a $25,000 down payment assistance for first time home buyers mm -hmm. and for small businesses, extending the tax deduction from $5,000. To fifty thousand. We've heard a lot about those plans in, in recent days. Your campaign slogan is a new way forward, and it's time to turn the page. You've been vice president for three and a half years. So, what are you turning the page from? Well, first of all, turning the page from the last decade, in which we have been burdened with the kind of rhetoric coming from Donald Trump that has been designed and implemented to divide our country. What? and have Americans literally point fingers at each other. Rhetoric and an approach to leadership that suggests that the strength of a leader is based on who you beat down instead of what we all know. The strength of leadership is based on who you lift up. You the strength of an American president. president, which is one who understands that the vast majority of us have more in common than what separates us. Madam that Vice is President, more than 70% of people... That is I don't think she actually heard the question because her response had nothing to do with the answer. About Holsters. turning the page on rhetoric that people are frankly exhausted of, Brett. More than 70% of people tell the country is on the wrong track. They say the country is on the wrong track. Wow. If it's on the wrong track, that track follows three and a half years of you being vice president and President Biden being president. That is what they're saying, 79% of them. Wow. Why are they saying that? If you're turning the page, you've been in office for three and a half years. And Donald Trump has been running for office. But you've been the person. Who what? <laughs> Whoa. You know, first of all, that pause was epic. She had no comeback. And she's literally like searching her 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 brain for a response. And I don't know if those earrings are giving her any kind of clues or tips or coaching uh, off camera, but that was epic. Come on, come on. Madam you Vice and I President. both know what I'm talking about. You and I both know what I'm talking about. I actually about. don't. What are you talking about? What I'm talking about <laughs> is that over the last decade, but people the have become... But she didn't know what to say? Listen. Over the last decade, it is clear to me, and certainly the Republicans who are on stage with me, the, the, the former chief of staff to the president, Donald Trump, uh, the former defense secretaries, national security advisor, and his vice president, one that he is unfit to serve, that he is unstable, that he is dangerous, and that people are exhausted with someone who professes to be a leader who spends full time demeaning and, and, and engaging in personal grievances and it being about him Madam instead Vice of President, the American people. People are case, tired of that. If that's the case, why is half the country supporting him? Why is he beating wow. you in a lot of swing states? Why, if he's as bad as you say, hmm. that half of this country is now supporting this person who could be the 47th president of the United States? Why is that happening? This is an election for president of the United States. It's not supposed to be easy. I know. So is she basically saying that half of America is just utterly stupid? No, but it's it not is supposed to be. It, it, it is not supposed to be a so cakewalk for So are they misguided, the 50%? Are they me, stupid? What, oh, what God, is it? I would never say that about the American people. And in fact, if you listen to Donald Trump, if you watch any of his rallies, he's the one who tends to demean and belittle and diminish Mm. The American people, he's the one who talks about an enemy within, within, wow. an enemy within, talking about the American people, suggesting he would turn the American military on the American people. We asked that the, question to the former president today. Harris Faulkner had a, a town hall, and this is how he responded. Ooh. I heard about that. They, they were saying I was like threatening. I'm not threatening anybody. They're the ones doing the threatening. They do phony investigations. I've been investigated more than Alphonse Capone. He was the greatest oh gangster. No, it's right. true. We've no, but think question. of it. It's called weaponization of government. It's a terrible thing. So, wow. I, I, I'm sorry, and with all due respect, that clip was not what he has been saying about the enemy within that he has repeated 
when he's speaking about the American people, that's not what you just showed. Well, he was asked no, about that No, 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 that's not what you just showed in all no, fairness no, no. and respect you to that you. That was the question that we asked him. Uh, you didn't show that, and here's the bottom line. He has repeated it many times, and you and I both know that. And you and I both know that he has talked about turning the American military on the American people. He has talked about going after people who are engaged in peaceful protest. He has talked about locking people up because they disagree with him. This is a democracy. And in, in a democracy, the President of the United States in the United States of America should be willing to be able to handle criticism without saying he'd lock people up for doing it. And this is what is at stake, which is why you have someone like the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying what Mark Milley has said about Donald Trump being a threat to the United States of America. He's quoted in the Bob Woodward book that way, yes. L let me ask you this, no, Madam Vice President. You call let's not Donald Trump the significance you, you, you of that. You call Donald Trump um, He's misguided. You say now he's he is unstable. unstable. He is unstable, Brad. Uh, he's not well. well. You say he's mentally not stable. Uh, he's not Let stable. Let me ask you this. And, you and Kamala Harris is at a point where you can just hear how much higher her voice is getting. The level of anxiety is almost reaching a, a pinnacle point, uh, a climax, if you will. And I feel like we're just moments away from Kamala Harris's uh, handlers stepping in and ending this particular interview early. We told many all interviewers be that Joe Biden was on his game, that ran around circles on his staff. When did you first notice that President Biden's mental faculties appeared diminished? Joe Biden, I have watched in from the Oval Office to the Situation Room, and he has the judgment and the experiment and experience experiment. to do exactly what he has done in making very important decisions on behalf of the American people. There Joe Biden, no Brett, concerns raised. Brett, Joe Biden is not on the ballot. I understand. And Donald Trump, Donald Trump but is. But you talked about it. And Donald Trump After is. After George Clooney said within a few minutes of talking to President Donald Biden Trump, at a fundraiser that he thought this Brett, was not the Brett, same Joe Biden that we saw on the Donald debate stage. Donald Trump is on the ballot. I understand. You met with him at least once a week for three and a half years. You didn't have any concerns? I think the American people have a concern about Donald Trump, which is why the people who know him best, including leaders of our national security community, have all spoken out, even people who worked for him in the Oval Office, worked with him in the Situation Room, and have said he is unfit and dangerous and should never be president of the United States again, including his former vice president, which is why the job was open for him to choose another running mate. So that is a fact. That is a fact. Madam Vice President, two more things. The level of the level of desperation of Kamala Harris at this point is just can you guys feel the tension in the air? I mean, you could just pretty much just cut it with a knife. I'm waiting for Kamala Harris to get up out the seat, walk across to Brett Bear and literally put her hands around his neck. You could just see how frustrated and how anxious she is at this point. I'm honestly surprised that Kamala Harris's handlers have even allowed this interview to go as far as it's gone so far. You were asked on 60 Minutes about the biggest threat that the world faces, that the U.S. faces. This is what you said. Which foreign country do you consider to be our greatest adversary? I think there's a, an obvious um, one in mind, which is Iran. Iran has American blood on their hands, okay? The, this attack on Israel, 200 ballistic missiles, um, what we need to do to ensure that um, Iran never achieves the ability to be a nuclear power, that is one of my highest priorities. A number of exper experts thought you would say China. Um, the FBI director had said that. But you said Iran. If that's the case, what do you say to critics uh, who look at the actions of your administration and say you're not acting like Iran is the number one threat? Well, uh, I will tell you most recently, whether it was in April or in October, 
and then several hours on each occasion that Iran posed a threat to Israel. I was there, uh, most recently in the Situation Room, in the most recent attack, working with the heads of our military and doing what America must always do to defend and to support Israel in its requirement to defend itself and to give American support to be able to allow Israel to have the resource. Did you notice Brett Baer look off to the side? Let's go back just a second because someone has clearly signaled to Brett Baer that this can't continue. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch his face. Watch his face and look at him react. He's responding to what someone's telling him off camera. Watch this. Say China, um, the FBI director had said that, but you said Iran. If that's the case, what do you say to critics uh, who look at the actions of your administration and say you're not acting like Iran is the number one threat? Well, uh, I will tell you most recently, whether it was in April or in October, and then several hours on each occasion that Iran posed a threat to Israel. I was there, uh, most recently in the Situation Room, in the most recent attack, working with the heads of our military and doing what America must always do to defend and to support Israel in its requirement to defend itself and to give American support. See that? To be able to See that? Allow Israel to have the resources to defend itself against attack, including from Iran and Iran's terrorist proxies in the region. Right. And that is and, and my commitment Iran. to that is unyielding and unwavering. Critics just say that you either relaxed or failed to, to enforce sanctions on Iran, allowing all of this money to flow let, into Iran, like let, billions. Let, let's in go back oil to Donald profits. Trump, who, who pulled now, out of who pulled out of a deal that would have actually put but here Iran are the, in check. The estimates and then in billions it was during Donald Trump's that administration that Iran, Iran regime that that we had a, an American military base that was attacked, where American soldiers suffered traumatic brain injuries and Donald Trump dismissed them as headaches, not to mention Madam how Vice Donald President, Trump has, all of this money has treated and has talked about America's military years. and military service people Critics calling them that it suckers goes and losers, Hamas has diminished and the significance. We're talking over each other, I apologize. I would like that we would have a, a conversation that is grounded in full assessment of the facts which includes, I think this interview is supposed to be about the choices that your viewers should be presented about this election, and the contrast is important. Yes, ma'am. And, and on the subject of Iran, I am offering... They signaled Brett Baer again. I guarantee they're about to end this interview early. Kamala Harris walks out. Watch. What should be an, an important contrast that is presented for folks to make a decision and there are critics that they feel who look at what the administration did and say and think differently. Madam Vice President, they're wrapping me very hard here. Ah, told you. I hope you got to say what you wanted to say about Donald Trump. There are a lot of things. There's more to say. I have there, much there more there to say. There are a actually. lot of things that people want to learn about you and your policies, yes. and that's why I'm, I invite you everyone here. to go to KamalaHarris.com. She just want to talk about Donald Trump. I think Kamala Harris has a secret fetish or even fantasy about Donald Trump. What did y'all think? And you will see that I have 80 uh, pages of policies that are quite comprehensive and should be um, accessible to anyone who would like to read them. And it includes what I intend to do about affordable housing, what I intend to do about small businesses, what I do. And that's why we to invited to you here in our economy, to see where you were in 2019 to, and to where you are now. America's military and ensure we have the most lethal and best fighting force in the world. Madam Vice President, and they're giving I, me a hard wrap Well, I thank Ooh. you for the time. I thank you for the time. It's good to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hey, told you it was going to happen. Sean Hannity here. Hey, I told you. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You I told you they were going to end this interview early, and the heat just got a little bit too hot in the kitchen for Kamala Harris. What do you guys think? I mean, like, this is uh, this is incredible. This is the lady. She's going for president of the United States here. 
who's going to take it? Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, who's a better fit for America? Who is a better fit for our borders? Who's a better fit for our economy, guys? Let me know in the, in the comments down below. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, check out my previous videos, and I'll see y'all next time.